Hey everyone, I'm Chris Anderson from Science Over Everything, and I'm at Thomas More College's Biology Field Station right on the Ohio River. Today, I'm going to learn from Dr. Chris Lorenz and his team on how they keep track of the health of the river ecosystem. Let's go check it out. Our job as the Ohio River Bioassessment Crew is to measure the health of the ecosystem by doing different tests. Um, we take the pH, the dissolved oxygen level, we do the turbidity by measuring using a secchi disc. Um, we also do the conductivity, take the air temperature, the water temperature, different measurements like that specifically. Um, and then we also do our specimen testing. We measure the length, um, the standard length and the total length, the weight, and then just the species of the fish that we catch. Doing the uh, fish species, we also want to test the water quality to make sure that the river is healthy for the fish to be able to live in. A uh, big one is dissolved oxygen. Fish breathe oxygen just like we do through their gills. Um, normally, if we find a lot of dead fish or we have turnover in the river, that's the first thing that we go to. Uh, pH of the water should be between 6 and 9. Uh, so if it's too low, it's too acidic, that kind of thing. Uh, turbidity is also important. That's the amount of sunlight that gets into the water and that tells us how far down the photosynthesis can go. So the Ohio River is arguably our greatest natural resource. And at the time that the first European immigrants came here, they found a clean, pristine river, rich with fish, abundance of wildlife, mussels, and other species. And then as we gradually developed the valley throughout the 1800s into the 1900s, we began to impact the river in a significant way. Whether it's runoff from the landscape, clearing the riparian zone, those are the trees along the shoreline, uh, starting to have industrial discharges, sewer water discharges, and throughout those two centuries, the river started to decline significantly in its water quality and its biodiversity. And of course, with the 1970s, we had the Clean Water Act in 72, the formulation establishment of the EPA in 1970, and we started to turn the corner. So we began cleaning up the point source discharges, the industrial discharges. They were either eliminated or permitted such that we reduced their impacts. And we saw market improvements in the river beginning in the 70s, 80s, 90s. So what that means is return of certain species like paddlefish, certain species like red horses, and other species that are sensitive to pollution. So their presence indicates clean water. Thanks to stricter regulation on industries and a coordinated recovery effort across multiple states, the Ohio River has come back strong. But that doesn't mean that there aren't threats, the biggest of which is from runoff. The farms that surround the area use chemical fertilizers to help grow their plants. These fertilizers contain a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus, which get washed into the rivers and streams. This causes a problem for the water quality, but it also causes a bigger problem, algae blooms. These algae are the base of the food web. Algae are critical to start the food web with photosynthesis, they create energy from the sun, and that feeds the rest of the community. So algae, important component of aquatic communities. There's green algae, brown algae, blue-green algae, a whole host of algae. One group in particular, blue-green algae, are named that because of the pigments they have in them. And when they bloom, they get really crowded and become dominant. So greens drop out, browns drop out, and some of the other algae. Besides being crowded, besides being abundant and driving other species out, they give off toxins. So these cyanobacteria, blue grays as they're called, are known to give out pretty potent toxins, hepatotoxins, neurotoxins, that result in fish kills, other wildlife kills, and can have human health impacts. So if we're swimming in the water, we could have a reaction. Uh, some of the compounds are volatile, just simply breathing them in can have a negative reaction. So there's a whole host of people now making concerted effort, formed what's called a Harmful Algal Bloom Detection Team, or network. And so we're trying to take more background data, more measurements, so that we can correlate factors that occur in the river when blooms do occur, and then work to prevent those in the future. That's our video. Thank you guys so much for watching. A big thank you to Dr. Chris Lorenz and his team for letting us join him in the field today. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe and check out scienceovereverything.com to learn about any current events and research in science.